All right, well, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's an honor to uh, be on the stage here with uh, Scott, Margin, and Carrie. Um, the topic du jour is DLT developments for payment clearing and settlement. Uh, for those of you who uh, probably have noticed that there's, I would say, uh, relatively fewer um, you know, blockchain related uh, sessions at, at the summit this year. And I think that's kind of the, probably the entry point for the discussion in terms of taking a snapshot of, of where we are uh, now with, with, broadly speaking, this technology stack, um, how it is or isn't relevant today and where it's going in the future. Um, so that's kind of the, the frame that we want to open the discussion with. I think uh, you know, it, there was a time when certainly we thought this technology was immune perhaps to the you know, infamous hype cycle and uh, it appears not to be the case. So from my perspective, we're sort of coming over that peak and, and, and asking ourselves, where is this going? And I think that's a, a fundamentally not a bad thing uh, for any technology to walk through that kind of uh, peak delusionment and then maturation uh, phase is, is really important. And, and in actual fact, there's a lot of work still happening uh, and a constant stream of announcements from companies like Ripple, IBM, uh, Microsoft, even apparently Facebook's getting into this game somehow. So I think there's a lot of work underway and it's a really an interesting time to see how and when this technology is going to perhaps be more broadly adopted um, and certainly from an enterprise perspective um, there's a lot of interesting developments, I think, in, in, in that space, which is certainly where, where, where my focus has been over the past few years. So um, what I'll do now is sort of pass it over to the panelists to both introduce themselves, their organizations, and, and maybe opine on, uh, on uh, the, inter the introductory question, which is you know, maybe take a snapshot of where you are with respect to this technology and, and where you see it going over the next few years. So Scott, we'll start with you. Okay, uh, Scott Hendry, I'm with the Bank of Canada. I've been uh, working in the fintech space for a few years, trying to understand uh, and follow the developments that are going on out in the world. And as you know very well, there's a lot of developments. And in particular, we've been interested in distributed ledger or blockchain and trying to understand what it means and how it can change the world and whether or not there's any belief or any value to the hype that says it is gonna change the world. So we've been working on what we call Project Jasper for the last few years, which looks at uh, central bank money on a distributed ledger and whether or not there's any value to that. To try and look through the hype to get an understanding of the technology and where it could actually have real payoff. So we've looked at wholesale payments, we've looked at central bank money uh, in a system with uh, settlement of securities transactions, and we've recently looked at cross-border payments. And just a couple of weeks ago, we put out uh, another paper in the cross-border payment space, looking at uh, techno um, uh, writing up the, the results of our technology uh, experiment, the latest one, looking at interoperability issues between two different DLT platforms. So we were working with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and they spun up a quorum node, or a quorum, pl quorum platform, and we were looking at a quarter platform, and what does it take to make the two talk? because that's the way we think uh, DLT is likely to develop in initially in silos and then eventually trying to figure out how they, to make them talk together. And uh, the interoperability issues that we see in the, the world today are gonna exist in the DLT space as well. So we're still going through this exploratory phase where uh, we're trying to understand the technology and get a better uh, view of where things are going. Thanks, Scott. So, Marjan de Latin, I'm the Global Head of Banking uh, at Ripple um, and joined Ripple t uh, two years ago, so uh, from a, let's say, more established world of Swift. <laughs> so it has been a big, uh, I should say, change since I, ha I have joined Ripple, I should say, uh, in terms of um, how the, um, uh, the hype of the blockchain or distributed ledger technology is moving towards the real world, which is around production uh, in the financial industry. Um, it's impossible to talk about blockchain or distributed ledger and not talk about crypto. I think what we see at <laughs> least is that there is now, uh, we are moving ahead or out of the idea that uh, crypto is only for bad actors. I think that's coming, yeah, of course, it's very early stage and it will still take time. Um, I don't think that um, the fiat currencies and real money will disappear. Uh, I think there will be some coexistence for good use cases. But you are, of course, uh, at a very early stage. 
2018, uh, from really uh, blockchain world and uh, crypto assets, I think it was a time for correction. Some of the use cases that uh, they didn't have a sustainable um, usage, they disappeared. And I think this is, this is showing, this is giving more uh, probably credibility as well to what is uh, surviving. Uh, and of course, but of course, it will continue, and we hope to to see a, a more mass consumption uh, adoption in the in the time that is coming. From really Ripple perspective, our use case is cross-border payments. Um, so our network is live since two years. We ended up last year with 200 um, customers, financial institutions, banks, and uh, payment service providers. And I think that's to differentiate from the hype. Uh, two, three years ago, uh, all these banks or financial institutions, they sign production contract with us. So we are beyond the proof of concept uh, or pilot. Um, so they are really deeply uh, integrating this new technology into the backbone of the payment processing, which is, I should say, a, a, a good achievement so far for a new technology. All right. Thank you. I'm Carrie Dennerstein, and I work in regulatory affairs at CLS Bank International. Um, just a quick background, CLS, we are a multi-currency cash settlement system, and what we do is we settle FX transactions on a payment versus payment basis, which eliminates the <coughs> settlement risk in those transactions. We do this for 18 currencies, um, like, I think it's between five and six trillion US dollars a day, gross notional, so we're systemically important to the FX market. And I, I like to bring up the systemic importance not because it makes me feel important, it does a little bit, um, because it comports a certain level of regulatory oversight. We're regulated primarily by the Federal Reserve, but we also have an oversight committee of 23 central banks, including the Bank of Canada, and we are subject to very comprehensive regulation, and for good reason, because if there's any problem in this critical post-trade infrastructure, that has a material real impact on the real economy. Now, what CLS has been doing is well, most notably for this panel, over the past year, in November 2018, we launched CLS Net. That's wholly separate from the settlement service, the systemically important service. CLS Net is a bilateral payment netting service, and it's intended for currencies that we don't settle through our systemically important settlement service. The bilateral payment netting service was developed over the past few years um, with a lot of collaboration with IBM and through the Hyperledger project, and it has a fabric platform. So we use Hyperledger Fabric as the underlying platform for this service. And that launched and it's live, I think, right now with five participants. Um, I like to keep reiterating it's live to distinguish between the POCs you hear about and the press releases all the time. This is something that every day is happening. So we believe strongly that hopefully this will increase and we'll have it increased adoption and potentially increased functionality on the service. But I do want to point out that this is a panel titled DLT Developments for Payment Clearing Settlement. CLS Net does not involve payments clearing or settlement. It is an information exchange. There is no access to central bank accounts. There's no movement of money is on the platform. And I think this is important because I think although we find that the use of DLT is useful in certain aspects based on its features, such as matching, netting, reconciliation, other post-trade processing functionality, our organization's view is that the technology is not sufficiently mature for use in critical post-trade infrastructure, such as payments, clearing, and settlement. So although uh, you know, most of the panel will probably focus on those critical aspects of the post-trade cycle, I just want to distinguish that there are differences in the applications and the uses. So Marjan, maybe I'll start with you. You, you have a you know, unique background in that you spent some time working at Swift, and now you're at Ripple. And so, Maybe you could um, elaborate on and compare and contrast a little bit what the fundamental value proposition of, of what DLT could be to uh, you know, cross-border payments. Well, <clears throat> I think um, the fundamental value of the distributed technology or blockchain is around the transfer of value. And coming back to the way that uh, is beyond SWIFT or I think is the way that the, um, the, the transfer of the value is happening today. Um, and again, my personal view is that technology is a means to an end. It's not because we have a technology that you have to now go around and find a problem. I think it's the other way around. Uh, is to, to have a problem and to see how this technology can help it. 
if you look at the way that the cross-border is happening today, uh, we are still living in a very fragmented uh, market. Of course, there are market infrastructure that are mm -hmm. facilitating a lot, like, like CLS, the way that the clearing and settlement is happening. But when you to do a B2B or really uh, cross-border transfer, you are in a sequential way of uh, transfer. So you have multiple intermediaries. Uh, you, you have uh, a, a very, let's say, archaic way still of funding uh, that uh, um, create a lot of costs and inefficiencies. Um, and when you look at the blockchain or distributed ledger technology, I think the most important um, um, characteristic of the blockchain is a decentralized uh, nature of the blockchain. And of course, I'm sure that you have heard about that, but really, I'm, I, I'm just putting that very simply. What does it mean, this decentralization? Um, decentralization means that you don't need anymore a central administration uh, to uh, ensure the integrity of the data and consistency. That's very important when you're talking about, um, about the uh, cross-border transfers. So basically that means that through a, a different mechanism of the consensus and the different mechanism of the protocols, you ensure that even if you are in a trustless environment, you establish the element of trust. These are probably very simple, but technologically is a big jump from where we are today, which is a very fragmented world. So when you look at how the, the, the end cost actually, which is users and uh, which is going to the users and why we cannot uh, dramatically shift the way that financial industry is, is um, uh, working is probably a s solution like uh, blockchain is helping a lot because this capacity of creating the trust in a non-trusted world and providing this immutability uh, and security that it is around uh, a DLT, in the longer term, it provides lots of efficiency in the reconciliation and it's uh, ultimately decreasing a lot the price um, uh, and the cost of the cross-border transfer. So I think when you look at from really user perspective, because at the end, this technology means that it should change something for the users and not only just uh, uh, creating new projects. I think from the customer experience, uh, when we look at the way that um, uh, financial institutions, they think and they adopt um, our technology, at least from Ripple perspective, is really bringing a new customer experience that is different from today is using the clearing and settlement, the real-time capacity of this technology, is improving the uh, operational inefficiencies that are very costly in the, in the transaction costs. Uh, and yeah, I think that that, from our perspective, is a real value. So given we're here talking about, um, you know, we've all been in this industry for a few years. Kerry or, or Scott, do you think that building on what Marjan just said, is this technology albeit it is a means to an end, going to have a dramatic impact and a fundamental ground shift of how we do business. Do you, do you think that we're still, obviously it's not going to happen quickly because we'd be looking in the rear view mirror if it had already happened. There's evidence of services now live in production, but they're still not you know, anywhere close to being critically, uh, uh, there's, there's still a, a significant lack of critical mass, but is this still on the roadmap for mass disruption in financial services? I think we have to be very careful of what we mean by mass disruption. What, it, what does disruption mean? Uh, I, I think that DLT is going to progress and it's going to grow and it's going to evolve and things will change in the payment space across the full spectrum of applications, but I think it's going to be a very slow grind. That nothing's going to change overnight, there's going to be no lightning bolt to, to change the world. That There's going to have to be cases that come online and work in production, as, as we have two examples here, and they need to prove themselves in the real world over time in uh, different uh, states of the world so that people can be become more comfortable with how they work and better understand them and then adopt them. So it's not going to be uh, a very quick change that the hype cycle, as you mentioned, is uh, getting, we're getting past that and I think that's a good thing. And we're getting into the point where uh, there are real cases coming online and they are starting to prove themselves. And we need more of that before there's going to be any real, really big change. And, and I think I'd like to add to that. I think it depends on the use of the technology. So even today, for example, if CLSNet um, had, instead of five users, say we had 500, right? I mean, that you would say is a pretty good enterprise size. I, I would still say that's not the type of service that, at least in my opinion, is a systemic or a radical innovation with respect to wholesale payments. I think 
You know, the question of this panel was whether or not DLT will be a radical or systemic um, impact, quoting a Bank of England paper. And, and my current thinking lately is, well, I think it kind of has to. And by that, I mean, if it isn't, if it, DLT doesn't introduce a radical and a systemic change, then what's the point? So if you look at radical first, I think the question is not, will DLT introduce, you know, is it better? It will introduce efficiencies. I think the question has to be, will it introduce radical change or radical inefficiencies? And that takes into account the trade-off that's needed between all the factors. So I'm talking about cost. I'm talking about, you know, replacing an existing infrastructure. There's got to be a migration, probably some type of interoperability. Um, when you use a new technology, any technology, there's going to be a lot more security testing. And that's not even taking into account the compliance and legal and regulatory costs. Is this fair? Absolutely not. If we were starting from a blank slate or you know, a, no infrastructure, then maybe from day one we would have chosen to use DLT. But that's not the current state of the world. That's not what, other, you know, if, that's not what it's like within a Canada or the rest of the world. And to pretend otherwise is well, foolish and puerile. Now, with respect to systemic, the idea of DLT is it's not an application level technology. It's an, it's an ecosystem technology. So one institution or one jurisdiction can implement it. But really, to get those benefits, which are you know, the changing business models, the way of doing business, then I would imagine you need a systemic impact. Because unless you have those network effects, those are what DLT is predicated on. And I think, actually, it's best put in uh, the Project Jasper phase three paper, which came out last year. Whereas, I, and apologies if I'm misquoting the paper, but one of the findings was that the operational efficiencies weren't entirely proven because you needed to expand the research to look at the whole post-trade value chain, and not even just that, also related value chains, so securities lending and repo transactions. And that just really underscores that you're not operating in isolation. So for DLT to really, really work for some of these critical infrastructure, my view is I think you need to have it be radical and systemic. Yeah. Like my version of saying that is that the current system is very rich. It does a lot. It may not do it as well as we would like, but it's extremely rich in functionality. And a lot of our DLT experiments are very focused. They do one thing. They might do that one thing very well, but it ignores the rest of the world around it. And this is a network technology. It works better the more that it's on it. The more players that are on it, the more functionality. And if you're trying to compare it to the, the current world, which, again, does a lot, uh, we need to think of a future and work towards it in which the DLT can start doing all that stuff. And these small steps, while necessary, because it's going to be an evolution, uh, it, we have to be more visionary to see where it could be going, where it will be going. But we also need proof along the way that it will pay off. So the theme of you know, decentralization, of new operating and business models, it seems like you know, in Jasper, we, we touched on these feature-rich silos. Um, what does the governance of this future state look like? How do we stitch all of this together, saying this is a network technology? I mean, all due respect, you know, Ripple is a, a vendor, an operator, but not very decentralized from what I can see. So how do we stitch together this universe of participants, govern it, uh, operate it, um, standardize it, I guess, so that you can bring together adjacent um, parties in a financial system somewhat more decentralized, but perhaps not likely entirely? Uh, anyone want to jump on that? Uh, sure, we will give it a try. <laughs> uh, the one thing that in our experiments that we, we've liked about DLT is that uh, you can have different entities involved, and they can be in charge of their little corner of the world. Like when we work with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the Bank of Canada issues the Canadian dollar instrument. Singapore is, issues the Singapore dollar instrument. We don't play in each other's world. They, we each have control of our little part of the network. But at the same time, we're working on the same network. We need to work cooperatively. There needs to be some form of centralized governance so that uh, you can make updates to the system. You can agree on what the standards are. Uh, and out there in the Bitcoin world, the current decentralized governance structure is repeatedly proving inefficient, ineffective uh, at making these regular changes. And you get forks of the system. So you need a good governance structure, and it needs some form of centralization. But at the same time, DLT gives you uh, some uh, 
in certain implementations, uh, the benefits of the decentralization in the governance. I do agree. I think um, the word of decentralization is it's, it's theoretical in terms of explaining what is blockchain, but you have different uh, flavor of blockchain now because obviously this technology is so vast and you have to adapt it to the use cases. Um, coming back to uh, one of the solutions that we are commercializing currently, which is really um, a transfer of value in fiat currencies. So it it's, does not involve the crypto, it's purely fiat to fiat, it's synchronization of the ledger between the parties. For that, we have created a governance which is owned by the banks that are part of the network. As you rightly mentioned, this is a network business. Um, and this governance is not around necessarily, it's a kind of scheme that we have added on the top of the permission network that, that is uh, exchanging the fiat currencies. This is very important because the data privacy is still one of the important elements of the uh, um, um, banking. So you cannot just exchange information in a public ledger like Bitcoin that everybody has a view on the same uh, balance. So indeed, I think you take the technology and you can adapt it to the needs. Uh, so the, that's the way that the governance. So this governance is um, is around the fiat currencies. But for instance, uh, you mentioned that uh, Ripple probably is not decentralized. I think when you compare Ripple, for instance, XRP, um, compared to Bitcoin or Ethereum, um, because at the end is the consensus protocol between the validators, uh, we do have, I think, 150 validators across the globe. And more, less than 4% of that is handled by, by Ripple. The rest of that is actually by uh, independent parties that ensure the, the, the consensus between the ledgers. So yes, there has been lots of work in ensuring that the governance, governance is evolving with the needs and is not uh, really just uh, handled by one party. Three quick points on decentralization. First, I find the term to be almost utterly meaningless. I, it is. I, I'm sorry, but you see it in context. Are we talking about an autonomous organization or maybe decentralized validations or components of it? Is that really any different than automation of certain aspects? Um, so uh, it's just another word you see thrown around all the time that you know doesn't seem to really fit. So I always try to explore further when someone talks about decentralization. My role is I'm in regulatory affairs. So my second point is, <sighs> Um, you know, while regulation in other fields, in the UK, in Australia, they're focused on accountability regimes. There's a senior manager's regime. There's an increased heightened focus on accountability, responsibility, and um, governance. So it's an interesting dichotomy then when you look to say that, oh, as an organization, a banking organization, we want to move towards decentralization. It seems completely inconsistent with the goals of regulatory oversight, quite frankly. And third, from a technical perspective, at, at what point did everyone decide decentralization is even better or more efficient? Now, I don't have a computer science background, but I read papers by those who do. And I understand that you can't get everything you want out of a technology and that there are trade-offs between speed, efficiency, and privacy. And I understand that to the extent you start decentralizing functions and you start using algorithms such as proof of work or maybe stuff that's a little bit less computationally intensive, that there's trade-offs to pay in terms of speed, in terms of privacy, in terms of all these aspects. So I'm not sure that you know decentralization should even be the goal. Yeah, like this is to me one of the, the center parts of what we're still trying to sort out and why it's going to be an evolution. What needs to be decentralized? Because mm -hmm. you can talk about many different things that we can decentralize. Is it validation? Is it governance? Like what is it? Uh, and that can be at a very fine detail or, or on a more, more global scale. But also at the same time, what can we take from our decades or hundreds of years of history that tell us that centralization does actually work? There's a reason why we have centralized now, because it worked in many circumstances and approved itself over an extended period. Sure, there might be areas where it's inefficient still and expensive, uh, but that doesn't mean you throw the baby with the bathwater. So what can we take from the current world? What can we learn from distributed ledger and decentralization to, to create a better future. And I think the problem is, particularly with cross-border payments, it's not like there's just a, there's one central party and everyone goes to them. There's a lot of stops along the way. There's a lot of steps to get a transaction. So to the extent that you could possibly remove some of those um, those steps frictions. and make things, yeah, frictions, exactly. and make things more efficient, then, I mean, if you want to call that decentralization, maybe we need another term there. And there are ways to introduce efficiency is by removing certain intermediaries. But I think complete decentralization, where everything operates by a smart contract is, um, I can't think of the appropriate it's, it's word. It's, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting idea. Um, 
it will definitely be take time. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's really what we even want to strive for, quite frankly. <laughs> All right, so you, so you heard it here first then. Decentralization's dead, and uh, it's <laughs> de, I think defrictionalization or something like that. So maybe that's a, a good transition into kind of some, maybe some of the specific use cases where you see a lot of friction that, you know, maybe in, in Ripple's case, that you've been able to but solve again, and improve But exactly, that again, it's going back to what you want to resolve, really, as a problem. And I think that's uh, coming back to our, our, our main use case, which is cross-border payments. Um, so, of course, the, the clearing and settlement is happening in this sequential way. But most importantly, there is a big cost associated to the liquidity management. Um, of course, liquidity management in the, in the local context is different. You have the central bank money. But when you get to the uh, cross-border, uh, again, border so that means that you are um, actually maintaining and keeping high amount of liquidity uh, in the destination account just to ensure that you can uh, make the transfers around the world. Uh, depending on the kind of banks, some banks, some global banks, probably they have this bandwidth. But when you get to the tier two, tier three, this is very costly. So they pay very cost, they pay, they pay lots of costs to get this liquidity. From our perspective, the use case that we see and we think that this is going to change, not necessarily in a big uh, liquid currency like uh, USD or Euro. I'm, I'm talking really about uh, more specific currencies and markets that the access and, and the, you know, the necessarily uh, financial institution, they do not like to have um, or maintain liquidity. Uh, we use as a, we look at a um, enterprise uh, use case for uh, crypto assets. And this is a product that we call Xrapid, which is using actually um, um, the crypto asset, in our case is XRP, uh, to source on-demand liquidity. So rather than maintaining an account, no robustor relationship, which is costly, uh, or even keeping liquidity in the destination place, when you need the liquidity, you can, you can use actually XRP as a bridge asset uh, to transfer from one fiat currency, for instance, Euro, to uh, Mexican peso in this case. This is happening in a matter of uh, seconds because the validator have been designed to ensure that the exposure uh, to the to the rate of the crypto assets is not important. So, this this I think it's when we see the users that are live now today and they are using the solution, it brings a significant um, uh, efficiencies and uh, let's say optimization in terms of the cost of the liquidity and in terms of the, the, the how fast and reliable they can they can deliver the, the, the funds. So yeah, for us, I think this use case, uh, I don't know many use cases. I think th th this, is, this is a use case, this is live. I think this is changing dramatically the way that the, the liquidity management is happening today. Kerry, how does that, I mean, you said CLS has 18 currency mm -hmm. pairs or 18 currencies. So does, is there a universe where there are different services providing you know, FX? Clearing and settlement for different, um, perhaps more illiquid uh, currency pairs, for example, and, and, and both systems coexist. Well, um, first, I guess liquidity is a, is a one of the primary concerns that we hear from our banks. And to that end, actually, we're also developing a service, a new service that's going to launch in the next few months. Apologies, I don't know the date. It's called CLS Now, and what that is, it's a new same day FX settlement service, and it's based on. Um, say conventional technology, centralized technology. We're not using a blockchain for CLS now. Um, and it's going to be selling. Why not? <laughs> Apparently, you can launch new services these days without a blockchain, which is what we're doing. And it's about converting liquidity um, for same day use. And it's, you know, it helps along the lines of the market's changing. Uh, you know, we've moved from T plus whatever to T plus one or, you know, moving, moving down the chain. So it's about converting liquidity. But the service is going to be launched right now in CLS currencies, or what I refer to as CLS currencies, apologies. The currencies we currently settle at CLS. Um, CLS does not offer settlement for all currencies, though. Um, CLS net, our payment netting service, is broader in scope. It's all currencies that aren't on an official sanctions list. But the CLS settlement service is only 18 currencies. And that's because there is high operational and other requirements to be able to onboard a currency into the system. And those are, because the service is critical, those are prescribed by regulation. So there's certain standards that need to be met to be able to settle a currency, such as that you have to have rule of law and other uh, specific requirements. So that's true. You can't settle everything through CLS net or CLS settlement service. 
and that does open up you know a need in the market because there is then some outstanding settlement risk so you know we try to address that through other services in the interim such as CLS net but we can't at this stage address everything via the CLS settlement service particularly currencies from emerging jurisdictions which aren't going to meet the high operational requirements so there is outstanding um, I say gaps, but you know, there's room for improvement. How about that? <laughs> room for improvement. Um, Scott, so what's next uh, from the Bank of Canada's perspective in terms of the work you're doing, uh, driving research? You know, most recently in the cross-border sphere, um, are you at liberty to talk about kind of where where the research agenda or the regulatory agenda is is focusing? Uh, in well, this space. we're at a bit of our own crossroads. So we just put out the paper from the latest phase of Jasper, and we're looking at various options for what to do next. But I think uh, it'll continue more or less in the same lines of what we've been doing. I think the most interesting areas that we could be looking at are in security settlement or cross-border payments. I think these are the the use cases that show the biggest payoff. And I'm, I'm primarily, I'm only basically looking at use cases where I think the central bank has a role to play. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other use cases out there for, uh, for distributed ledger that could, should be investigated, but where could the central bank potentially have a role to play in providing a, uh, a coin for the, the network to, to improve settlement? And that's uh, the most interesting ones are in cross-border payment or through security settlement or through a combination of the two. Exactly. International yeah. security settlement. So our uh, investigations will continue in, in these areas. Uh, and in, in detail, I'm, I'm not sure where we're going to end up or where we're going to go. So there, there's, there's no big reveal today. Just thought I'd try it. <laughs> Carrie, you mentioned that CLS now is not um, blockchain based. Correct. So is there any uh, of this technology on your product roadmap that you're aware of? or? So right now we're working on really developing and um, expanding CLS Net. Yeah. It's, it's a newly launched product. And again, when you're working in the enterprise space, things take time. So there's no, I would say, new products that are in the pipeline. But we continue to you know, look at potential enhancements to the services. You know, is there a, additional features that we could add to CLS Net? But I think right now we're just looking on building up the network building those network effects that really are required to have something be successful, particularly in the netting space. That's how netting works. You need more parties. Um, so again, uh, apologies. I have nothing particularly newsworthy as well. Um, I'm sorry for everyone. <laughs> no big reveal. Um, so we'll just do kind of one more question and then open up to the audience for a, for a, a Q&A, I guess. Um, but are we going to be sitting here talking about um, DLT at next year's payment summit and, and uh, where will this be in 10 years? So pull out your crystal ball and uh, uh, we'll give each of you a shot at that and then we'll open up for a Q&A. Uh, unfortunately, yes, I think we will be sitting here next year still talking about this. The room might be a little smaller, might be a little bigger, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but we have some cases that, use cases that are in production now and these, these are uh, being applied in like very core areas, core markets. And I think we need to see the, the proof from these on whether or not there's real payoff. And whatever evidence can be uh, provided will be important for determining what the future of this technology is. And I think there's still a lot of us waiting for that proof. And I think uh, we're still going to be waiting until we actually see it. Uh, because this is a very expensive area to play in and we don't really want to be risking our core systems, our systemically important systems, until we see very good proof that it is the wave of the future. Marjan? Coming back to proof, I think we are continuing to, <laughs> to bring proofs that that will be definitively a, a, a big priority. Uh, I agree that uh, indeed uh, more you bring credibility, volumes, critical mass, this is where this technology will have a success. Um, I think regulatory side, we hope to have more clarity on the regulatory side. I think it's moving and progressing well. And there are some boundaries now that are uh, somehow designed, but I think we will have, hopefully we will have uh, more. And uh, from Ripple perspective, um, uh, one of the use cases that we are working uh, uh, with a specific priority is around remittances 
and the SME business. These are the underserved um, um, segment of the market. So the financial, I mean, the global market infrastructure are not designed to help this segment. Um, so probably it's a bit utopic or sentimental way. I, I really hope that we, this new technology can change the way that the underserved uh, um, category of this uh, economy, this global economy can, can take advantage of that. So a year from now, I don't really think anything's going to significantly change in practice. I think, you know, if the conference organizers put together another DLT panel and be on the stage, I, I imagine we'll still be talking about it. I think what I hope in the next year is, in addition to further research, because again, we need more research in this area to be able to make educated decisions. I also hope that we have some clarification on some of the taxonomy. I mean, I kind of went off on the word decentralization before, but there's a lot of other terms that are out there that really are not defined or they're used differently. Uh, they're used by the press, they're used by banks, they're used by regulators, all in a different way, in different jurisdictions. And I think it does a disservice because if you're trying to look and research and try to, you know, you, you need to be speaking the same language, so to say. So I hope that at least there's a further clarification around the taxonomy and the language. And I think that'll really help with an understanding by all parties of what the benefits are beyond, you know, media hype and press releases. So it's cool. my hope. All right. Well, we'll open it up for questions. I can mostly see everyone here, but if uh, anyone has any questions. There we go. I see two hands over there. Gentleman here. Okay. Why did Bruce Schneier this morning say no blockchain? <laughs> I want to know why. <laughs> Actually, why did both those guys say no blockchain? Well, Tim Berners might be joking. But, yeah. Why? Why? What does that uh, Well, they'd have to answer that for themselves. Exactly. But I think, I think that's <laughs> illustrative of uh, what we've been talking about here and the fact that there's still a lot of hype. and. Uh, because there's that hype, that means that there's very strong proponents and there's very strong people that are against it. And the lack of evidence that we talked around, the lack of proof, uh, means that these both sides still exist. We don't really know uh, what, uh, what the value is of this thing, I find. There's, there's a lot of conjecture, there's a lot of belief, but I'm still waiting for the proof. Uh, and I think until we get to that point, they're still going to find people saying that blockchain's a really bad idea. And there are some use cases where it is a really bad idea. And potentially some use cases where it, it might have some payoff. And then there's the problem of what's a blockchain, right? Well, well I think also they were talking about it in the context uh, of information security and the CIA triad, which was confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And DLT has some really unique aspects in those three regards, uh, confidentiality, um, you know, how can you see the data? What are you, are you going to be using a proof of work or what other type of algorithm? Integrity, I mean, I think one of the primary benefits of DLT is we talk about integrity. It's immutability. You can't touch the data. So maybe that's a strength. But availability is also something that's generally looked at as a benefit. If you distribute the data across different nodes and one node goes down, well, OK, good. Then you could bring it up at another node. Now. Here's the problem. If you have that availability, if you really capitalize on that benefit of the technology, well, what does that do to confidentiality? If you have a group of financial institutions and you take, say, um, I don't want to pick a, say TD Ameritrade, right? And their node goes down. Um, are they comfortable with CIBC having all of their data and bringing it up on their node? See, so that's where you get into an interesting interplay between those three aspects of the security. So I'm not going to read his mind and say what he was thinking, but I do know that depending on the way that a certain DLT arrangement is organized, it can present some unique um, considerations in terms of security. If I may just add, I, I was not uh, unfortunately in this session, in this panel or session, but JP Morgan a year ago uh, as well, it was a question about blockchain is bad, but. Today, they are coming with a new business model, and they are even issuing now JP Morgan coin. So you know, the world can change. <laughs> yeah, if I was going to add anything, I'd say that, you know, uh, I guess not being a security guy per se, that if you look at kind of the issues around key management and custodianship of digital assets and the pervasiveness of hacks, that, you know, there's certainly a lot of security issues there uh, in terms of even how those entities are, are regulated. But, Broadly speaking, I'd say that you know, the the issue is that the attack surface, if I was trying to use some security lingo, has somehow grown, and and clearly there's a lot of vulnerabilities uh, that have been able to be exploited in in certainly public blockchain environments, 
um, that I think was underpinning kind of the commentary from, 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 from Mr. Schneer. Um, there was another question. Dragos. Uh, yeah, so pretty much I've heard a lot about the cross-border payments. And I know that Jasper, one, two, they focused on Canadian payments. And they identified amazing opportunity as well as challenges. Uh, the question is, what is different in cross-border payments that makes it more appealing at this time? Of what characteristic makes it a better fit or easier to implement than the not? Uh, I think... Uh, well, my perspective on that is fairly straightforward. In the, in the domestic payment space, or even in the, the security settlement in Canada space, there are centralized players already. There's already a system in place to do this in a very efficient and well-functioning, robust manner. In the cross-border system, uh, yes, there's a system in place to do it, but we know it, it has a lot of warts. We know it has problems. There's a lot of pain points there that make it slow, inefficient. Um, so there, there's room for improvement. There is no central player there. And there's a reason why there's no central player, because it's, it's a hard business to be in. Uh, and the governance as well makes it very hard, or regulation makes it very hard to come up with a single central player. SWIFT has managed to become somewhat of a central player, but they only do a portion of the job. So there's a, there are significant frictions there that uh, mean that there's an open space for distributed ledger to step in and potentially fill the gap. And like I said, uh, distributed ledger allows different players to still control their portion. So it might bring some benefit in that regard while still getting the benefits of the decentralization. So I, it could be a good compromise that allows us to make a step forward that uh, well, we've had problems making steps or in that direction to this point. Shri? Two questions for Scott. Uh, so firstly, uh, based on the Jasper projects that we've done, I think you are now in iteration four. Um, how would you summarize how the areas where we think there are benefits, but there's those that we've already highlighted where blockchain technology is not adding much value? Uh, the second question I have is on the notion of a stable coin. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know, movement in the industry towards stable coin, driven for a large part at concerns with uh, using crypto assets as settlement assets uh, due to things like liquidity, price volatility, and obviously shadow dealing that happen, which is an unregulated market and whatnot. So the question I have is uh, what's your position, or Bank of Canada's position, on stable coin, potentially even as an issuer of stable coin, uh, on blockchain, which could be used as a settlement asset. Uh, thereby essentially having the qualities of settlement finality, which is back to the central bank and whatnot. So. Uh, first of all, I'll start off with what I should have started off with a long time ago. These are my own opinions. <laughs> this does not represent this, uh, the uh, <laughs> any policy or position well, of, the of the central bank. Uh, so big disclaimer. I forgot to put that up for um, So yeah, on the first part on benefits uh, of DLT, I've, I've tried to give a flavor of that, uh, what we've learned from all of our Jasper stuff here today, that I don't see DLT as a really big efficiency payoff uh, in for operation of a core system uh, or in simple operating costs uh, because like the current system works really well. Uh, well, for the use cases I'm talking about, so high value payments or uh, even the regular retail payments, the system works really well. Uh, so then we need to look for use cases where there are currently big frictions. And in that case, there, there, there is potential payoff there. But there's still a lot of open questions here. Like one of the benefits they talk about DLT is, is reduced back office reconciliation. And that's a, an area where I've seen a lot of conjecture and I've seen no proof. So um, I need the banks to say, or show me their business processes for their back offices, like the full business map, and say that steps 5 through 15 are going to disappear in a DLT, and they're going to save X number of dollars. Like, show me that, and then I'll believe that DLT is really going to start paying off in replacing a current system and how it functions. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to still look at 
where I think the current system doesn't function so well. Uh, the second one on stable coins. Well, you can look at the coin that is in Jasper as a stable coin. I think we somewhat invented the concept. Exactly. Actually, but. It's a digital depository receipt, we called it, uh, in the sense that every, or every dollar of coin that circulates on the ledger is backed by something, a, a dollar in the account at the Bank of Canada. Uh, and that's just one way of operationalizing it. You could think of it being done uh, without that backing, but we, we did it with full backing. Uh, so that's a form of stablecoin. And because it's linked to other systems, uh, at least in the way we were thinking about how it could operate in production, then it would be like a perfectly stable coin. There would be no fluctuation. The same way now there's no fluctuation between the different types of commercial bank money and cash and everything else. Uh, I'm not sure anybody else there out in the private sector can issue a stable coin that would be perfectly stable uh, because they don't have the interoperability with the other systems, at this point at least, to ensure that stability. Um, I'm not sure that fully answered your question. Just follow up. I think the notion of a DDR was essentially a stable coin that was backed by, it's a settlement asset held by the bank at a certain time, as opposed to the stable coin that you're seeing in the market right now, it's, it's really more back to commercial bank money. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's meant to solve the problem of cross-border settlement, speed of settlement, and so on and so forth. So uh, ideally, if the central bank actually issued stable coin that could circulate in the economy, just like we have in Canada, we have the notion of e-money, yeah. then you would essentially have uh, you know, similar property, then we have similar properties. And so I was wondering, uh, is central bank looking at issuance of stable coins more broadly in the market? Sure, but, like but why would the central bank need to issue a stable coin? Because uh, we issue cash, it's sort of backed because we have an asset on, a, on, on the asset side of the liability that backs everything that's on the liability side, but it's not specifically tied dollar for dollar um, in a stable co coin type of fashion. So we issue things that aren't linked in that direct manner. Uh, so like, what is a stable coin in this context? Well, the question will be yeah. more, if a commercial bank were to issue a stable coin, which is backed by funds held, let's say, in a trust account, is that a regulatory framework that Bank of Canada is looking at? That's one question. And secondly, would yeah. you actually directly issue stable coins? We are, uh, yeah, a lot of us are talking about these issues as more stable coins come out. But one thing I'd like to point out is that the Bank of Canada doesn't have regulatory authority here. Uh, we are the oversight authority for systemically important systems which this at this point, or at least at introduction point, is, would not be. Uh, at some point when the legislation passes, we will be, have regulatory authority for retail payment systems, uh, but that's coming at some point in the next couple of years. So at this point, we're not there. Uh, so we have to get more, much more into this. But the one thing I'd like to point out and that I've been asking myself for the last little while, what's the difference between a stable coin put out by a commercial bank and what they already do. They already put out a digital currency, a digital money that's not fully backed. In a sense, not dollar for dollar, but yes, they got this whole mass of assets on the other side of the balance sheet that backs it. But it's a fractionally reserved bank putting out digital money. So how is that different from these stable coins? Uh, is a stable coin better because it's fully backed and tied one for one in, in real time. Uh, and are we really willing to say that the commercial bank money is not safe? That the, the, be a debate. It's a much yeah, longer debate. And th these are some really fundamental questions that we need to sort through because it really would de depend on how things are operationalized. So I guess you're saying is, is stable coin just a snazzy new shiny word for e-money in certain contexts? Yeah, we, and we this, is, this is the conservative case because you have stable coins that, you know, you mentioned back one for one. That's the conservative case. But there's stable coins which are, uh, I say backed based on algorithms, but premised on algorithms are ones that attempt to use leverage or a combination of being backed by other crypto assets. So, you know, at least in the most conservative case, is stable coin the same thing as e-money? What's the difference? Yeah. yeah, and I, I think I see our J.P. Morgan rep at the back. Uh, maybe we can uh, get his opinion on, the, on this question afterwards, that they have two coins out. We can make some room for it right here. <laughs> <laughs> so 
And the proof will come over time again, as we see. I, what is the difference between these two? And I think the biggest difference between them is in our minds. That just the, the perception of what this thing is and the confidence that it makes us think about. Uh, one is very, tra very traditional and time tested and we know it. The other one is very new. Uh, but what, over time, the new one is going to be less shiny and it's going to be more known. So then what's the difference between the two? Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. Uh, and they raise very fundamental questions about what is money. So a payments geek like myself, a monetary theory geek, uh, is very interested in what's going on here. Great questions for you. You've hit your limit of five, though. So we're going to have to move <laughs> on to uh, anyone else. Did I see another one? Yeah, right here. meets the requirements of the system and the benefits also come through. Are there new risks that we open ourselves to which are greater than that exist today for the current system? Or are we just thinking of unknown unknowns <coughs> and taking a real slow approach to blockchain? I mean, I would, I think we'd have to, get more specific to, to really answer that question. Um, w w what risks, you know, obviously we're looking at what's happening out there in the public blockchain sphere and, and observing a tremendous amount of risk, uh, whether it's from a fluctuation and volatility perspective or a cyber perspective or pretty much any other perspective. Um, you know everything we've done with Jasper and the and the work uh, around this space has been coming at it from that perspective as regulatory you know from a regulatory or operational perspective looking at is this introducing more or how do we eliminate risk as we kind of continue down the journey and measure obviously the benefits or the potential benefits of of what a new architecture could could um, give us. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I can't really answer the question yeah. without getting a little more specific. I, I really liked what Carrie said earlier about accountability. That uh, accountability is very important. Um, it has been for a long time and is, in many cases, becoming more important. And if you read through the principles for financial market infrastructure that come out of the BIS for systemically important systems. It's enthralling the read, very, by the way. The very first one, yeah, it's, it's a <laughs> riveting read. You should get that. Uh, governance is number one principle. Uh, who's accountable? And this is a, a very important um, point for distributed systems to sort out. How do you distribute and maintain accountability? Uh, I think that's that's a big, big risk. I. I seems like there's systems that can solve this, that mix the distribution and the, um, and the centralization. But, yeah. uh, I, I can't answer the system also unless, uh, unless you give specifics, apologies. And that's because there's no one blockchain. There's all different implementations, all different services. I think in your example, we're assuming that it's already launched and active, right? See, I think some of the risks I, and challenges I think of also are pre-launch. Like, if you're looking at anything cross-border, then that's going to need some coordination amongst regulators in all different jurisdictions. And depending on what it's concerning, um, I mean, I don't know if some of that coordination might be insurmountable. I'm, I imagine a lot of central banks aren't necessarily going to give up sovereign control. So although, for example, Jasper Board demonstrated that you can have, um, you can use hash time lock contracts to you know, settle things instantaneously between separate blockchain applications. I can't imagine all the central banks getting together and saying, you know what, we'll just go up one platform and we'll let Bank of Canada run it and forget what we're doing. <laughs> we're good. I payments mean, Canada. maybe make payment, we'll let Payments Canada run it. <laughs> be great. It would be in great hands, but I'm, I know some central bankers from other jurisdictions who would probably have some problems with that. So in my mind, <laughs> from a regulatory perspective, I think of a lot of challenges even getting to that point of the question. Yeah. And of course, the you know the information security. It's it's always the unknown unknowns, but I think this is a whole different beast. And to really provide the level of security that's required for systemically important applications, I, I mean that's going to require a long runway to be able to have that type of insurance assurance. Excuse me. So given those considerations, mm -hmm. what will CLSs and, and uh, 
Ripple's uh, market coverage and product set look like? I'll give you a break here, five years. Well, um, things move slow in systemically important FMI land, so it wouldn't be radically different because we have a very long process before launching something. Um, in five years, what will change? We'll have CLS Now, which is our same-day service, which doesn't use blockchain, but hopefully we'll be expanding currencies and enabling a quicker exchange of liquidity uh, for the same-day market. For in terms of CLS Net, Again, there's going to be currencies which we just don't have the ability to launch in the systemically important service right now. So hopefully, we'll, pre we'll be providing different type of risk mitigation to those. And you know, we'll be increasing operational efficiencies. But I wouldn't imagine it would be vastly different than what we do today, only because when you're operating in a critical sector, you can't move fast and break things. You know, We're not, we're not Facebook. But. But from a Ripple perspective, if I may add, is well, we have a network of more than 200 uh, financial institutions. I think uh, what is happening as well, apart, outside of blockchain, is as well, this is a new ecosystem. There are new entrants, there are many fintechs, uh, it's open banking everywhere. So, you know, I think there are so many other angles of the payments that are changing as well, and blockchain probably is at one element. But the way that we see it is that uh, the, new, the, the fintechs, the new entrants, they are they are looking at this de uh, development and implementation very differently. They don't have uh, difficult legacies. Um, but we, we, we think that this is a network business and we have to increase it more and more. So hopefully, I don't know, 1,000 in five years' time? That would be good, good figures for us. Nice. I think we're pretty much out of time, so I want to thank everyone for coming, thank the panelists, and uh, enjoy the rest of the uh, summit. Thank you.